Chinese people themselves want freedom and democracy. And I, I would like to think as a Tibetan that it would be great if China becomes free, independent and a democracy. And that Tibetans and China, we have mutual respect to look at each other as neighboring country. Well, welcome everybody to this podcast of the Macdonald Laurier Institute in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, my name is Charles Burton. I'm a senior fellow at the Macdonald Laurier Institute. And it's a great pleasure for us to welcome today uh, Tenzin Sundu, who is a very well known, world famous um, Tibetan activist and um, poet, a literary figure, who will be talking to us about. Uh, his current trip to Canada and um, uh, how we can further the, the cause of uh, ensuring the rights, human rights and sovereignty of uh, Tibet for the people of Tibet. He is from uh, Dharamsala, India, where he lives in exile along with His Holiness, the uh, Dalai Lama and many other prominent uh, Tibetan figures who are currently unable to live in their homeland. So uh, Tenzin, welcome. Uh, perhaps you could start off by telling us uh, the what you hope to accomplish in your trip to Canada this time. Um, thank you. Uh, firstly, Charles Burton, thank you very much uh, inviting me here at the McDonald Laureate Institute. This is my first trip uh, to Canada. Uh, I've never come here before in this place, uh, but I've been to the U.S. four times earlier. And uh, on this speaking tour of the United States and also Canada, uh, through Canada, I am I've started my speaking tour from Toronto. Um, I was there for four days and spoke in different other places. Now here in Ottawa. And tomorrow I will be in Montreal and after that to Calgary, Vancouver, Victoria, pretty much both the East Coast and the West Coast. And uh, finally, then I return to India. Um, so what I hope to achieve on this speaking tour is to have a, for, for myself a better understanding of uh, Canadian politics. How do the Tibetan refugees live here? Uh, the Tibetans have been living here from 1970s onwards um, and they have now become citizens here in this country. And I want to understand uh, from a closer proximity and also living with Tibetans in this area, what is, what is the policy of, of, of Canada towards Tibet and how does Canada's policy uh, is changing vis-a-vis um, -vis China? Um, and 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 uh, human rights that is such an important place in Canada's politics. What does it really mean when it comes to China trade? These are the things I want to understand. And from my side, I want to present the case of Tibet. Uh, what is happening in Tibet inside Tibet today? So, um, following up on that point, um, what is uh, your interpretation of current conditions in uh, the Tibetan regions, which I would say includes the Tibetan Autonomous Region and parts of Sichuan, all of Qinghai and parts of Gansu province? Um, how do you feel the situation is evolving? And uh, I guess the other associated question would be, uh, what do you think that Canada should be doing to better protect the uh, rights of Tibetans inside Tibet and uphold our Canadian values in global affairs? Thank you, Charles, um, on that question. Uh, you yourself have uh, studied in China and you have been writing about China for such a long time. So you actually know very well the case of Tibet. China invaded Tibet from the year 1949. And in, uh, in 1949, when China was invading Tibet, it was not just Tibet. China was also invading its other neighboring countries uh, like East Turkestan, which is the country of the Uyghur people, and then uh, Southern Mongolia, which is the other part of Mongolia. The, the outer Mongolia is free and independent today, but uh, Southern Mongolia is under Chinese occupation today, and so is Manchuria. And today there are these issues uh, of China completely uh, destroying democracy in Hong Kong and now threatening to invade Taiwan with military force. So this is the situation today. But when we talk about Tibet, 
we are talking about 2.5 million square kilometer of land, which makes almost about one quarter of China's landmass. And therefore, China is so very insecure that when there is a freedom struggle in Tibet going on, China fears that such kind of movements, um, which is also going on in East Turkestan and Southern Mongolia, China fears that China's uh, major chunk of land, which is occupied country, may rise up in revolution. And this is China's biggest fear. Now, there is a unique relationship between China and Canada. And, and that is particularly Canada's trade with China. Canada has been trading with China for now almost about 20, 25 years. And today, if you go into any of the shopping malls in, China, in Canada, you will know that almost 80 to 85 percent of products, consumer goods in Canada are from China. So Canada has benefited at the cost of Chinese people's uh, disenfranchised situation. Chinese people have been put to work almost like slaves within China. China has taken natural resources from Tibet, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia, which then go into making cheap made in China products uh, in China. And then can countries like Canada, United States, and West many of the Western European countries are buying these products. So these countries are not having to uh, exploit natural resources in their own countries. Canada is such a vast and rich natural resource country. And yet uh, Canada has benefited from these kind of China trade. So it is important for Canada because Canada has been a main beneficiary in the case of cheap made in China products sourced from Tibet and Tibetan people having been marginalized, having been suppressed with no freedom for, uh, uh, for, for, for their religious practices and also uh, no uh, right to speech or, uh, or uh, media, free media press in Tibet. Tibetan people have suffered so much. And in the in the recent cases, because of that kind of frustration and um, and protests, uh, more than 157 Tibetans burned themselves in the form of self immolations. And such kind of pain and suffering going on in Tibet, while Canada, mostly common ordinary Canadians, do not even know how much they have benefited at the cost of Tibetan people's suffering. It is responsibility for Canada to take note of the human rights violations going on in Tibet and therefore take responsibility for the benefits they have reaped for the past 25, 30 years. Well, I think that, uh, you know, certainly there is increasing awareness about the um, nature of the Chinese regime. Uh, you know, a few years ago, um, Canada, uh, gave His Holiness the Dalai Lama honorary Canadian citizenship, although this doesn't seem to have transmitted into um, much change in policy of the government of Canada uh, toward uh, Tibet and, um, you know, the distinctive nature of the uh, Tibetan civilization, culture and religion. But um, last year, the Canadian House of Commons did pass a unanimous resolution uh, affirming that Ch PRC policy in the Uyghur regions amounts to genocide as uh, defined by the UN Convention Against Genocide. Now we see in uh, Tibet policies of um, removing Tibetan children from their villages to uh, um, boarding schools where they are trained in Chinese language and learn Chinese history. And I think uh, the schools have a, an effect, if not a direct policy of assimilation of Tibetan children into what might be defined as the Chinese ethnicity, which, you know, is now a new concept as opposed to Han ethnicity and, uh, as you said, Mongolian, Uyghur, uh, Manchu and other ethnicities. And the other policy that we observe is uh, China's um, uh, interfering with the traditional lifestyle of Tibetan nomads and forcing them to settle in um, um, in villages that you know don't allow them to to uh, continue their their distinctive Tibetan lifestyle and might also be seen as having an impact on 
Tibetan culture succession and and uh, the transmission of of Tibetan culture. Uh, do you think that uh, the Chinese government's policy towards uh, Tibet can also be defined as uh, as genocide under the international um, covenant that both China and Canada have uh, ratified? Do you think that that we should be regarding uh, China's policies in Tibet as genocidal policies? Well, Charles, you picked up on two very important key issues. One is the China's colonial boarding schools in Tibet, something what Canada has also done to Native Americans, Native uh, people of Canada. Um, and the other question is about how Tibetan nomads, which actually make to almost about 70 to 70, 75% of Tibetan population are nomads who live on the grassland and they are losing their land, their ancestral land, they are losing and they are now being forced or coerced to settle down in artificial villages. These are two pertinent and burning issues inside Tibet today. And this is changing the very basic life of the Tibetan people. And these are attempts by China to homogenize the Tibetan, small Tibetan population. You know, population of Tibet inside, it is just 6 million. And China is 1.3 billion population. And China wants to homogenize this and make every Tibetan Chinese. This cynicization is an attempt by China to uh, completely uh, uh, finish off, diminish the Tibetan unique culture identity, which China feels is the only obstacle to gain control over Tibetans by politics, by fear. They have failed for, for the past 70 years. In the 74 years of China's occupation of Tibet, you know, we have lost more than a million Tibetans already. China has destroyed so much of monasteries, uh, traditional uh, cultures and, and uh, uh, religious uh, practices, which of course China also suffered during the Cultural Revolution. We are now in a situation where we are barely surviving. And on top of this, now they are coming up with what they call bilingual policy, where they are forcing Tibetan children from the age of four and five to be forced to go to boarding schools where they are now planning to uh, make every Tibetan Chinese by giving them only Chinese language education. And we fear that in the next 10, 15 years, every Tibetan children will forget Tibetan language and learn only Chinese. Now, if that is not genocide, then what is? And so, Canada must know this is happening while Canada continues to benefit from cheap made in China trade. I think that, you know, I think that there is some misunderstanding among the population about what constitutes genocide. And they, they tend to associate it with the Holocaust of the by the Nazis against uh, the Jews and others in the course of the Second World War. But this is really about um, attempting to erase a great cultural uh, civilizational tradition from uh, from um, the world, and and you know this is uh, certainly uh, my interpretation of reading the Convention Against Genocide, very much part of it, including the removal of Tibetan children from um, their homes for this education purpose, and some of them I know are sent to um, schools in inside China, every province and autonomous region is required to have a school uh, oriented towards uh, education of, uh, of Tibetan children. So they're far, kept far away from their families. But I think another issue um, which has been raised uh, to me by some senior um, Tibetan uh, monks is the problem of the transmission of the esoteric um, culture and religion of Tibet. In other words, the Chinese are restricting the numbers of monks, as you pointed out, destroying temples, but also uh, preventing um, the learning of, uh, of the Tibetan cultural tradition and religion. Uh, is, is this something that you see? Is, is there enough being able to be done by the Tibetan community in exile to protect the, um, the esoteric doctrine that underlies the overall culture of of Tibetans and Tibet. 
Well, you know, um, when you say es esoteric uh, Tibetan culture, for, for us, uh, the Tibetan Buddhist culture uh, that we practice, this is something we have embraced from India. This is the Buddhist heritage which constitutes philosophy of love and compassion. It institutes science, uh, especially mind science and psychology. Psychology, study of psychology in the West, starting from Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung is only about 100 years old. But in Buddhist philosophy, we study the mind and we have learned from India that when you understand the mind, one can gain control over the physical world also. So this is one of the key important uh, studies that we place so much of importance in, in, in Buddhist uh, philosophy and studies. It also includes medicine, uh, where you learn how to use uh, um, uh, plant-based um, uh, uh, materials with which one can uh, correct the balance in our human living. Uh, we also study um, uh, astronomy in, in this and astrology. These are uh, powerful streams of science and philosophy. There are key aspects of Tibetan Buddhism that we study and, uh, and that we continue to share the knowledge uh, to people around the world. And because some of the most important Buddhist texts were translated into a Tibetan language before it was destroyed in Nalanda University fire in the 12th century. So you see the Tibetans are holding some of the most important Buddhist relics and uh, scriptures with which we are able to not only share it back to India, but share it to people around the world. And therefore you see there is so much of respect for um, these Buddhist uh, scholarship uh, here, even in the West, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama comes to uh, Canada or in Europe and or in America or Australia, that respect is not just because he is a Buddhist monk, but because there is so much wealth of, of knowledge, especially uh, the science of the mind. Um, this is the uh, Tibetan heritage which is facing danger from China because China looks at uh, the, the Tibetan Buddhist heritage as something very unique which defines Tibetans different from China. Um, so therefore they are trying to target this. Um, but at the same time, if you go to Tibet as a tourist, which is difficult these days, but even you are able to go to Tibet, you will see uh, superficial exoticization that there are certain monasteries there are certain small amount small number of monks being placed to do symbolic buddhist debates or prayers but these are symbolic superficial exoticization being created only to symbolize tibetan buddhism but in reality china is targeting um, uh, this very tibetan heritage and real thriving and scholarship that goes into tibetan um, buddhist studies has been not only uh, discouraged but systematically destroyed and therefore the institutions that his holiness the dalai lama has started in india and then also spread in different parts of the world with which we are able to not only conserve and preserve our own, uh, our own Buddhist heritage, we are able to share it to many other peoples who find interest uh, in this. I think that, you know, certainly there are a lot of Han Chinese who also um, are uh, Buddhists who, who have enormous reverence for uh, His Holiness and, and the other um, uh, living Buddhists who um, you know, are, are are the characterization of the uh, of the Buddhist teachings and doctrine, but this then leads to uh, the question of the future for these figures. Uh, already, you know, the Benchen Lama, um, current uh, Benchen Lama, has disappeared. Um, we don't know if he is uh, still uh, living somewhere in China or if uh, he is no longer um, in corporal form, as one might say. Uh, although, of course, the Chinese have. Uh, come up with an impersonator who is not accepted as the Benjamin Lama by, I think, anybody really except the Chinese Communist Party. But, you know, with this as the precedent, uh, one does wonder about the reincarnation of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who, you know, is uh, 20 years older than I am. And, um, you know, his, physically he is uh, 
not as strong as he was. Um, what uh, do you think will happen in terms of uh, the next incarnation of the Dalai Lama, who is, of course, such a central figure in uh, rallying support for uh, Tibetan Buddhism and the Tibetan cause around the world? Well, uh, Charles, you have such great understanding, especially of the complexities of Tibetan issue from within the community and also how the international community looks at uh, Tibet. Um, when we talk about uh, the Buddhist lineage in the form of His Holiness the Dalai Lama as the spiritual and political leader of Tibet, and also uh, the, the, the issue of Pension Lama that you raised, uh, his Holiness the Pension Lama, and you correctly mentioned that the real Pension Lama um, has been uh, disappeared by China since 1995 from the age of six. And today at the age of 34, he's nowhere to be seen. And China has disappeared him. And that's mainly because China fears that there is the, the systematic, uh, you know, uh, order of uh, leadership in the Tibetan community is what they are trying to target and leave the Tibetan community without uh, the leadership. But when we, when it comes to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, today, especially when we talk about the future leadership of, of the Tibetan community, we have to now look at a much larger picture. It's not just the Tibetan community. Today, China is being isolated by international community. China has problems of trade with Australia, with Canada, with, with, with Europe and America. China has become the country of distrust after the 2020 pandemic. You see, and then within China, Chinese people are today saying we are done with CCP rule. We are done with Xi Jinping. And last year we have seen very strong, courageous voices by Chinese people who are themselves saying we do not want Xi Jinping. We do not want CCP. So you see, China, Xi Jinping is actually facing that kind of problem from within. So therefore, for, or for Xi Jinping's leadership, he wants to maintain control over Tibet and therefore for him, um, you know, the future reincarnation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama is important. So is uh, that important for, uh, for India? India is facing China across the Himalayan borders and Chinese soldiers, you know, Almost about 100,000 Chinese soldiers are camped on the Himalayan border and threatening India every single day. And China is a threat to U.S.'s supremacy. China is a threat to human rights and democracy in Europe and also in uh, here to this country, Canada. So you see, a, a future, future of, of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's leadership and issue of Tibet is going to be international. So many countries are going to find the issue of Tibet important in their own internal politics and their chemistry with, with China. So therefore, when we talk about the future of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's uh, leadership and also the reincarnation, we have to look at it at a much larger picture. And I'm, I'm, I, we have already seen the United States passing this important resolution in support of his Holiness the Dalai Lama's choice of his future incarnation. I'm sure Canada would also pass similar uh, uh, resolution and hold on and support uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama himself in, in his choice of uh, future incarnation. So I think these are important points because many countries today find China really a threat to their own uh, freedom, uh, democracy, uh, trade. So when it comes to future of the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama made it very clear that his reincarnation will be his own choice. And he said he would leave behind written instructions where and when the next Dalai Lama would be found. But he also said with great sense of humor and says that I'm healthy, I'm fine. China should be worried about the survival of Chinese Communist Party. But having said this, I think, you know, what I, in roundabout, what I want to say is, uh, the future of, of Tibetan leadership has to do with many other politics to countries around the world. And I believe everybody would support His Holiness Dalai Lama making uh, the choice of his reincarn reincarnation.
Well, I think you certainly make a very good suggestion for the government of Canada that we should do this kind of preemptive resolution to say that we support the choice of His Holiness the Dalai Lama as to his own reincarnation and would not accept an alternative produced by the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing. They do have an institute of Tibetology there. And about 25 years ago, they offered to show me photographs of the um, Banchan Lama as a child on the basis that um, they, um, you know, that his parents didn't want him to be subject to publicity. But now that he's 34 years old, that argument no longer applies. Incidentally, I refuse to to look at the photographs. Um, I guess perhaps our final discussion could be about um, how you feel um, nations and, and Tibetans should be addressing the changes in China to bring about a a, a more satisfactory situation for Tibetans being masters in their own territory, uh, using having their own language and their own culture and civilization for their own people. You know, I know that India, for example, has uh, has indicated, or at least some Indian diplomats have indicated to me, that there are concerns about the genocidal policies in Tibet because you know most Tibetans support India, but if they are able to, in effect, convert. Uh, Tibetan young people into vassals of, of Han Chinese culture, that this could have a geostrategic impact that would negatively affect um, the border between uh, India and China. So, you know, what I know there are differences of opinion within uh, Dharamsala among different factions and among the Tibetan community abroad about. Uh, how we should be proceeding to to further the Tibetan cause. Uh, what are your own views on on this matter? Well, I think um, Canada, for one, recognizes Tibet as a part of China, which interpretative, interpretatively could also mean that and, uh, since China's occupation of Tibet, which is 1949, Canada recognizes that pre-1949, Tibet was free and independent and Canada must come forward to say uh, and to recognize the historical independence of, of Tibet. Um, at least to say that there was a point of time in history that Tibet was free and independent, and ever since uh, People's Republic of China uh, invaded Tibet, Canada may be recognizing Tibet as a part of China, but Canada must also say that it was, it was an, uh, it is uh, today an occupied country. Um, uh, I think this stand is uh, similar to United States uh, also. Um, so you see, uh, we are now in a situation where China is not only controlling, occupying Tibet, China is also saying that Tibet had always been part of China for forever, always in history. Now, this is the problem where China kept on creating new narratives. When China invaded Tibet, China was saying that they were liberating Tibet from feudal society. Now, if they had liberated Tibet from feudal society, now that the liberation is over, they should go back. So uh, your question about how we would look at Tibet, uh, about, about China and Tibet's relationship is, you see, China and Tibet, we are just next to each other. And we had always been neighbors. And when you, when you, your two countries are bound by a border like this, you cannot escape. It's just like Canada and, and the United States today. Uh, we look at China as our neighboring country. We have had troubles with them, but we also had marriages. We also had um, uh, shared Buddhist cultures also. But today's China is different. Today's China is not only capitalistic and uh, a market economy is also a dictatorship. Xi Jinping is maintaining singular uh, authoritarian leadership in China that the Chinese people themselves have lost the confidence in Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese people themselves want freedom and democracy. And I, I would like to think as a Tibetan that it would be great if China becomes free independent and a democracy and that Tibetans and China, we have mutual respect to look at each other as neighboring country, not as master 
uh, China uh, master over each other. So we would want China to be our nice neighbor, that we respect each other's sovereignty and, uh, uh, and our uh, cultures. In that way, it is not just uh, China's occupation of Tibet, but we also look at China's other occupied countries like East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia, and Manchuria. Now, at least in the case of uh, uh, East Turkestan and, and Mongolia, there are very strong voices for the freedom and democracy in these, two, uh, these uh, two other occupied countries. So these should be free and independent and, and that kind of right to make their own decisions, right to self-determination should be there for, for these uh, other people. So therefore, my last point here is that, uh, um, you know, Canada, in, uh, as a modern country emerged as a free and independent country. But there was a point of time it was the country of the uh, native Indians uh, here in Canada. Today it has emerged as one of the most respected country with freedom and democracy. Canada, if Canada respects, because Canada holds so much of respect for uh, democracy and freedom, Canada must also respect that to the Tibetan people and people of East Turkestan and Mongolia. They must also have that. And Canada must also respect uh, freedom and democracy in China. Today, China, is, China does not have that, you know, um, and yet Canada is one of the biggest trading partners uh, with Xi Jinping's government who is not giving freedom and democracy to the Chinese people. So therefore, it is important that Canada knows where the products are coming from and who are making these products and from where these products materials are coming from. So it is important for Canada to do this. And therefore, uh, you know, Canada upholds not only freedom and democracy in Canada, but also respects freedom and democracy in the countries from where Canada has been, you know, making all the benefits because of uh, cheap made in China products. So I, I would like to think that as much as I, we, we would want freedom and democracy in Tibet, we would want to have that uh, in China also. Yes, I think certainly, you know, our Prime Minister, when he was in New York uh, a couple of days ago, did acknowledge that the uh, Chinese lithium mining is based on slave labor. And, uh, you know, we, Canada, I think, is more and more aware that we should not be enabling uh, slave labor or other um, violations of international law. And of course, you know, both Canada and China have ratified the International Covenant on uh, uh, so, uh, cultural, economic, cultural and social rights. And that covenant starts off with a, a, a declaration about the self-determination of peoples. And I think, you know, it would, one would be very hard pressed to think that uh, Tibetans uh, would not like to have self-determination and not be ruled by a different uh, race who speak a different language and have a different culture uh, in, a, in a faraway capital in Beijing. And certainly, you know, I, based on my own experience, I don't see any um, cultural uh, conflict between the Han Chinese and the Tibetans. I think that there is a lot of respect and mutual acceptance of those two cultural traditions. And perhaps on that basis, uh, these political issues can be resolved. Uh, we've gone uh, well over time, but uh, if you yes. have further words you'd like to say, let's uh, yeah. let close off with uh, with whatever I haven't asked you about that you'd like to yeah. get on. The, uh, so one last, thank you. Thank you, Charles. So um, one last point I want to make here. While I was touring the uh, United States, um, it is a time when the United States has introduced one very important uh, bill in both the houses and it's a bipartisan with bipartisan support and the bill is um, re resolve Tibet China conflict and that bill is to recognize Tibetan people's right to self-determination so this means that United States is wanting to, is proposing to recognize Tibetan people's right to self-determination. United States is saying, let the Tibetan people decide what they want. And if the Tibetan people decide to have independence as their own future of their country, United States would uh, is now proposing that United States would recognize that. Now, that's a very important step the United States is taking. And I would think that this is such a fair and justified state's 
uh, statement that United States is making. And I'm sure that Canada would be inspired and encouraged to, to, to do the same kind of a stand. Um, um, at least let Canada decide um, and, and say, let the Tibetan people make their own call whether they want to uh, remain under Chinese occupation or if they want uh, independence as their goal. So uh, that kind of a stand would be fair and I would uh, encourage uh, Kansa also to propose such a bill in here in the Canadian Senate and this uh, proposal would then would be fair and also would be a message of um, inspiration for Tibetans inside Tibet who are living under Chinese occupation for all past 74 years. So thank you very much, Charles, having me here on this important discussion on the McDonald Laureate um, at the McDonald Laureate Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I wish you a very successful uh, tour in Canada and, and a safe journey back to India. Thank you. Thank you.